Hello cave dwellers, welcome into the cave. How much would you pay for a used Nintendo GameCube? Well, I'll tell you how much I paid for this one and you might want to hang on to your seats here because this cost me a whopping five pounds. A whole five pounds. I picked it up on a service called Spock, which is like a classified ads thing. There's a little app on your phone where you can search the local area. And uh, this came up um, some time ago now, admittedly. It's been in the storeroom for a while. I've been meaning to get to it and that's exactly what we're doing today. Now, if this doesn't work at all, if it's eaten itself from the inside out, it's still five pound well spent to put this in a cabinet and show people this is what a Nintendo GameCube looks like. But if we can get it to work, it's the absolute bargain of the century. It came with no cables. It was in condition unknown, so I am expecting the worst. And uh, we've got the help of Mark Fix's stuff with us today. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take it apart and we're gonna attempt to upgrade it with a, an ODE, an optical drive emulator. So that will allow us to use SD cards instead of the, the little cut down size DVDs that the GameCube used originally. So let's see how we get on and let's see if we can induct this into the museum for people to, uh, to get hands on with or just look at in the glass cabinets next to me. This may well be the first of future short maintenance style or induction style episodes that I'd like to bring onto the channel because in running the exhibition space here, things are failing. Things are failing already, um, not in a big way. So for example, the arcade cabinet, the, the joystick dropped, one of the nuts had come off and we had to fix that. There was a problem with the Amiga's return key, some keys on the BBC Micro, all of these little things add up. So I'm gonna have to keep on top of the maintenance. Um, as well as keeping on top of bringing new things online like this and having spares available. So there may well be future episodes like this, a short, sharp, update, maintenance, all kinds of things that we could throw in the mix to keep things running here. And I hope you enjoy this one. Let's see if we can get this GameCube working. This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com, purveyors of quality joysticks for all of your retro kit. Joysticks, adapters, arcade control parts, and more. Check them out at MonsterJoysticks.com, and we thank them for supporting the cave. These GameCube games are US versions and this is a PAL console, so I grabbed my own local pickup. This PAL copy of Tony Hawk's 4 for 6 quid, a quid more than the console. Alas, upon testing it turns out that the mini DVD drive is deader than my singing career. Thank goodness for that. And by that, I mean thank goodness for this. It's an optical drive emulator called the GC Loader. This will allow us to load GameCube ISO files from an SD card. I'll get the screwdriver. This kit comes with the board itself. There's also an injection molded drive spacer. And an SP to SD adapter to allow us to use software on the console. There's also the required screws and an SD card extension adapter. OK Mark, let's get this installed. Using a game bit driver we open up the console's case. Did you have a GameCube when they were originally released, Neil? Well, when was it released? Uh, 2002 in the EU, I think. 2002, yeah, I was well on the PlayStation 2 train by then, so I'd got myself this brand new PlayStation 2, I got myself a Sony widescreen CRT, 24 inches, because that was the biggest that I could carry up the stairs back then, and they weren't cheap, and I had this gorgeous setup, and I didn't, to be honest, I didn't think twice about the GameCube, I had my PlayStation 2, and it never even got the time with me, and that's why I'm really looking forward to getting this working, hopefully, and exploring that library. Well, that's the lid off. We'll be replacing the mini DVD reader, which means we'll need to at least partially disassemble the console. We'll just disconnect the ribbon cable here. How about you, Mark? Did you have a GameCube back when they were released? Uh, yeah, in fact, I bought one quite early on. We got them, yeah, it was 2002, I think. And I was magnetically drawn to its sort of quirky little format. And what were you playing back then, I suppose? Mario Kart was a given, as it is on every Nintendo console. Yeah, well, I'd really enjoyed Super Mario 64 on the N64. So for me, it was all about getting hold of Super Mario Sunshine. There were quite a lot of really good titles, actually. And how did it stack up against the N64? It was a definite improvement, wasn't it? It was superb. But the real surprises for me came from other titles. And one that really stuck with me was called Eternal Darkness. 
It was a survival horror title that delved into the Lovecraftian Cthulhu mythos and played some excellent tricks on the player. That, that, that's the one that breaks the fourth wall multiple times, doesn't it, in certain sequences? Yeah, it had a sanity meter, and if that got too high, weird things would happen within the game. So it would come up with like um, a memory card error message or switch to an AV2 screen. I actually remember one time it turned down the TV volume with a fake OSD. And I was complaining that Mrs. Fix's stuff must be sitting on the controller and going to a bit of a shouting match. <laughs> but I think the latest and greatest game is the one I'm playing now, which seems to be Remove the 5,000 Screws. These Nintendo designers really don't want anything to fall apart, do they? This is pretty much as far as we need to go into the console to replace the drive mechanism. This is the DVD-ROM header right here. This needs to be removed from the shielding now. The drive emulator replaces the whole DVD drive, so we're left with no moving parts, which should be good for reliability and, well, it's pretty amazing stuff, really. It really is. I think it goes here. Yep, that makes sense. You can never be too careful, though, so I'll just check it's the right way around for the main board. Great. You've not asked me for the soldering iron yet, Mark. Is there any soldering needed in this mod? No, Neil. Just screws. Lots and lots of screws. <laughs> And that's fitted nicely. That, that looks like it's firmly in place. That's not going anywhere. Once we have this fitted, I think we can just close the console back up. The back panel looks a little bit worse for wear, but for £5, I really can't complain. Yeah, although I do think we should glue it back together. Using a bit of Gorilla branded super glue, I'll pop it back into place. And after a very light sanding, the repaired piece fits like a glove. Not perfect, but a lot, lot better than it was, so I'm happy with that. Let's get this together and see if it's working. Maybe just give the fan a quick dust down. It's worth giving that a clean. That'll do for now. I think the GameCube is such a clever and compact design. It's definitely a different look when you consider its contemporaries were fairly utilitarian looking Xbox and PS2. Especially, do you remember the Spiced Orange GameCube? That's a favorite of mine. The plastic mount is intended to fill the hole left by the missing original drive. With the included SD extender, we can connect it to the ODE. The SD extender slot gets screwed into place here. And then we can do a functional test. Although, Mark, is it just me or are we starting to see a problem here? No problem. I have it all under control. Thank you, sir. And it was at this point that Mark realised he'd screwed up. And when I say screwed up with all of those screws, he really has screwed up. I had indeed. So quick as a wink, I needed to open the whole thing up again in order to mount the mount on the shielding. I'm on the case. I'll just give this a quick wipe down as well. I think this console has had a tough life. 
but it's still a bargain for £5, regardless of whether it reads discs or not. This must be the only optical drive emulator that takes two SD cards. What functionality does it add? Well, I must admit that I don't really know yet. I know that it adds some kind of write ability, but it's something that I plan to investigate properly once we have the console working for reference. The main SD card we're using is just 64 gig. This is fine for me as I prefer a selected library, but the maximum supported card size is a whopping two terabytes. Two terabytes, that would have been a lot of GameCube titles. They're about 1.4 gig each in that reduced DVD size disc. So we've got about a dozen on this card and there's plenty of space left. Are we done yet? Yes, it's time to test our work. So the GameCube here we can see boots up into a piece of software called Swiss, which lets us choose and run programs from either of the SD card slots. Although running from the card underneath, bottlenecks the data and has some compatibility issues. Running from the GC loader has no such bottleneck in issues however, and although it's not 100% compatible, it does have a very high compatibility list with all of the commercial titles. FMV runs well from the GC loader, and it looks even better once I put the TV into the proper ratio. You can definitely feel the N64 heritage of Super Mario Sunshine here. In many ways it's a polished update, but with lots of new gameplay mechanics I've really enjoyed playing this one for the first time. I like fast shoot 'em ups but Ikaruga's outing on the GameCube was a bit feisty for me. It's also an interesting way to format the playfield. We've got Portrait on a landscape screen. It's a tough one, this really is bullet hell. Look at this madness. F-Zero GX was a console exclusive and carried on the F-Zero legacy from previous Nintendo machines. And for me, it's still impressive today. Yeah, it really does shift and the impression of speed is quite astounding. Sonic Adventure DX is a direct port with some added bells and whistles, but it still handles admirably. This has been a successful mod for us today, it's a console that's definitely worth exploring, and it's a welcome addition to the cave exhibition. Five pound, very well spent, I hope you'll agree. Um, that's incredible. I can really get stuck into the GameCube library now. Between um, this and some of you may have seen on the recent donations video, a Panasonic Q was donated with a whole stash of games. So we, we can explore that whole library. And um, it's really nice to have a GameCube in here. I need to get some more controllers. I've only got the one joypad. And this is, you know, you've got four on the front there. This is clearly made to be a couch co-op machine. And that's what we need to do with it here now. So more people can enjoy it together as they currently do with the N64. I have to say that is probably the most popular system in the exhibition here at the moment is four player N64. People switching between GoldenEye and Mario Kart. So maybe we can put this next to it and have um, an AV switching box so people can use the same big screen and sort of switch between the N64 and the GameCube and make a direct comparison between the N64 and this, it's, its uh, successor. I think people would enjoy that. It's been a really successful day. And I must say a huge thank you to Mark Fix's stuff as always for helping us out. He's had to scoot now, so he's not with us right now. But uh, go and check out his channel, Mark Fix's stuff. I'll put a link in the pinned comment if you wanna go and uh, subscribe to him. and. Um, Here's to many more maintenance and uh, update videos to keep this place going. I'm off to play some GameCube. Take care everyone, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.